Let's get started. Uh, Woman Jika, um, which is welcome in the language roots of the Bun Wurrung and Waru Wurrung Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, where panelists and many of us today are located. Um, on behalf of the Melbourne International Jazz Festival, I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, uh, the Bun Wurrung and Waru, Waru Wurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay respect to elders past and present, as well as to the emerging leaders of tomorrow. I also wish to respect the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today, the Jagara, Yagara and Turubal pe uh, people of Mianjin. Uh, thanks so much for joining this session, uh, the Funding Landscape Career Development Panel, which is part of Melbourne International Jazz Festival's These Digital Times series. Uh, obviously, given the uncertain state of the world, um, it's really fantastic that um, the festival's done some innovative programming and allows us to be able to spend some lockdown time uh, listening to a really fantastic panel. Uh, just to let everyone know as well, uh, so wanted to, um, this, section, this session will be closed captioned. Uh, the closed captioning will be available on the panel. If you'd like to access the captioning, you can uh, press the CC, bottom, uh, CC symbol at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to send us any questions or thoughts throughout the panel by popping them into the Q&A window or directly in the chat. Uh, we'll answer them at the end. Uh, thanks to our partners, thanks to the partners for this series, uh, Melbourne International Jazz Festival, APRA AMCOS and Arts Centre Melbourne. Um, and also a reminder, and I'll remind everyone at the end, um, really worthwhile watching the rest of the, these Digital Times performances throughout the day uh, via melbournejazz.com. Uh, so I'll briefly introduce myself and then also the panel as well and get everyone to give, give a bit of information about their, where their relevance is towards the world of funding. So uh, my name is Andrew Tuttle. I'm the um, Manager of National Engagement at APRA AMCOS. My role is with working with the rest of the writer services team around the country to, um, so those of you who are composers and songwriters, <coughs> excuse me, um, you will have worked with us in the first instance with any APRA questions you have. So my role specifically um, has a strong focus on our grants programs, including our music grants and our sustainability fund and our national events for members. Um, alongside that, I've got a fair amount of grants experience with different other bits and different pieces as well. So I'm a musician who has received funding from Australia Council, um, Arts Queensland and RADF, um, which is a Queensland program as well for um, various career development, touring and recording projects. Um, I'm a current Arts Queensland assessor, um, have previously done stints with Australia Council's peer assessor uh, board as well, and I'm also a former freelance grant writer. So there'll be a lot of questions I'll be asking the panel as well um, about their various thoughts. So I'd like to um, quickly introduce the panel and hand over to them. So firstly, Chloe Turner, who is the Senior Arts Officer at Creative Victoria and working on the Vic Arts Funding Program. Uh, Chloe's background is quite extensive as well. So she's a co the co-founder of the Melbourne-based queer record label Tender Collection, a member of the Dark Synthwave Music Duo Activities of Daily Living and has previously worked with Creative Partnerships Australia, Listen and other roles at Music Victoria. Steve Richardson is the creative, is the state manager for Victoria and Tasmania of Creative Partnerships Australia, which is a fantastic organisation as well, likewise with uh, Creative Victoria. Um, we'll talk a little bit about with Steve, a little bit about what more Creative Partnerships is. Um, Steve's also previously and concurrently been involved with Circus Oz, Melbourne Festival, and founded uh, Black Arm Band and Dance Massive, two fantastic organisations. And finally on the panel, we have Adam Simmons, who is one of Australia's most prolific and varied artists. He's an acclaimed multi-instrumentalist. He's an, uh, an educator, a teacher, and an artist. He's collaborated with fellow luminaries such as Nigel Kennedy, Peter Brotsman, uh, Sandy Evans, You Are My, Gotche, and countless others. Uh, his educational portfolio includes uh, VCA, University of Melbourne, and the Messina Conservatorium in Sicily. Uh, so thank you all so much for being involved. It's a pretty powerhouse panel we've got here on an early Saturday afternoon. Um, I guess before I get started with some questions and talking points, is there anything that any of you on the panel um, would like to expand upon what I've said about how your roles and lives are relevant to funding? Yeah, sure. Um, 
I guess just a little bit more context. Before I was working at Creative Partnerships Australia and Creative Victoria now, um, I've also, similar to you, Andrew, you know, received grants, applied for grants, and was a freelance grant writer um, and a peer assessed for Creative Victoria and the Australia Council. So I feel like I've got a pretty good understanding of many sides of the ball um, in terms of grants and, you know, the feelings of getting grants, not getting grants and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Chloe. Um, anything, anyone, Adam or Steve, anything else either one of you want to add or want to get going? All right, let's get cracking then. Uh, oh, well, I'll so, add a little, oh, if sorry. I may. I was going to let Stephen. Um, I'll just say that, yeah, I, as an artist and as an uh, organiser, director of festivals, uh, different organisations, I've counted them up last year. I've done about 70 grants, I think and with roughly about a 50% success rate. So I'm above average in mm. terms of that. And, I've, and that's been across individuals, organisations, as well as um, uh, been a peer assessor for Creative uh, Arts Victoria more so, uh, maybe Creative Victoria, and Regional Arts Victoria, and then other organisations assessing different things. So I've, I've sat on both sides and I, uh, I know that there's no answers, no simple answers. The other thing that I've been doing that might be, that I'm hoping will be of relevance today is uh, acting in a pro bono role from Victoria's Jazz Industry Strategic Action Plan that uh, trying to help them with a statewide initiative that's meant consultation with a whole bunch of different people, including topics around funding. So, you know, making submissions to Creative State for the Victorian Ministry of Creative Industries and the recent Senate inquiry. So yeah, I'm bringing not just my personal perspective, but hopefully representing some of the views uh, that are being expressed in the current times. Great. Um, Stephen, is there anything you wanted to add before we start or? Yeah, look, first of all, thanks so much to Melbourne Jazz Festival for the opportunity. It's really terrific that, you know, we all get the chance to to kind of virtually be together. Um, I, for one, am certainly missing, you know, the kind of live, in real life opportunities that Melbourne Jazz has provided in the past. It's such a really great point of meaningful belonging in my life. So it's really terrific that we've organised this. Probably, you know, from an overarching point of view, you know, um, so fabulous to be in the presence of Chloe and, Ann, and, and, and Adam, um, both of whom I've worked with in the past. And I guess, you know, from a, a sort of helicopter perspective, you know, I've raised a lot of money. I've, you know, been in the grant system for uh, uh, many, many years in terms of my working uh, professional life. I'm much more focused now on the sort of private sector support than government grants. Um, but, you know, I guess I've always appro approached um, the issue of money with the attitude that there is always enough money. Uh, and that is, uh, that, that coexists with the notion that there is never enough money. Um, in the field of creative endeavour, of course, we always have many more ideas and many more projects than there is ever enough money to support. So I think, you know, um, occupying that kind of um, um, posture in relation to fundraising is a really healthy uh, perspective because, you know, artists are incredibly resilient. People do, you know, incredible projects on the smell of an oily rag on nothing. Um, and uh, equally, also do incredible work when there is an abundance of, of money. But I think, you know, in terms of a personal empowerment perspective, you know, bringing that sort of perspective forward in relation to fundraising is a really um, empowering, personally empowering perspective to bring. Fantastic, thanks for that. And I think that's a really great perspective, which we'll tease out throughout this discussion as well. And this is a reminder to everyone who's um, joining in that funding the idea of fundraising isn't just, you know, government grants funding, there's, you know, private funding, there's other ways of building a sustainable career for yourselves as well. So with some of these questions, um, I'm going to take a bit of a license and make the assumption that there'll be some organisations here, but also I'm going to work with a lot, some of the assumptions are going to work on based that it's people as individual practitioners. So I'm going to ask some questions um, for the panel. If there's things you want to talk about with that panel, great. If not, 
if you don't want to talk about a particular question, that's fine. Um, I personally don't particularly enjoy down the line ones. So if someone's answered a question, you just go what they said or pass off as is. So start really, really 101 style. So with your various organisational hats on, but also as practitioners yourselves, um, what grants of those available um, would you find uh, that are more suitable or potentially less suitable to jazz practitioners? So I guess I'm I'll happy start. to start. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I can start. Um, I guess from a Creative Victoria perspective, we've obviously got our Vic Arts Grants Program, which is our main, most competitive kind of biggest funding program for artists and independent arts organisations. Um, and, you know, so jazz is obviously, um, jazz artists can apply through the music category of that program. We've also got the Creators Fund, which is um, our kind of research and development program, and also the Music Works grant program, which is more for kind of music industry focused activity, uh, showcases, touring, recording, those kinds of things. So, I mean, yeah, those are our kind of free options um, that are kind of most appropriate for, you know, independent artists in general, but also, yeah, jazz artists. Yeah, great. And I guess um, just taking a more um, multi-layered step with that, I'm following off from that Chloe as well, so that for anyone not aware, there are multiple different funding organisations that you can apply for and most you know, most encourage funding from other opportunities. So for, um, for Victoria, Creative Victoria is a great, you know, is the Creative Victoria is the resource for all things state funding. Uh, on a national level, uh, for anyone not aware, not aware, the Australian Council of the Arts is the federal fund, um, arts funding body. So uh, traditionally, last, over the last few years, I should say, their projects, there's organisational grants, but there's also several grants for um, individual practitioners and groups as well. So there's um, projects funding, which covers a lot of things like your albums, recording, touring, other things like that. Um, and there's also uh, a career development option, which is more to do with mentorships and kind of furthering the creativity side of things. So, um, as, and as well as those, and also get wanting to get um, Adam and Steve's thoughts as well, just there, it can't hurt to think of local funding as well. So different local organizations, whether there's umbrellas like Regional Arts Victoria in Victoria or Radiff in Queensland or other places, uh, it's not worth ruling out local funding as well because you know some of those local councils might be small. It might be smaller funds, but it's still some further income as well. So sorry that was a little bit for me, but um, Adam or Steve, if there's anything you want to add to that point about what's available, what's accessible, and what's What's, I guess, the more likely application um, type of grants to be funded for jazz artists? Um, I might add, being a jazz artist, um, <laughs> there's, yeah, certainly thinking of the three levels of government, um, as you mentioned, there's Australia, Council, federally. There's also, uh, at this particular time, DFAT uh, is not, you know, thinking of international travel is a bit crazy, though I've, there's, uh, the Australia China Council have just opened up grants uh, for June next, uh, the 8th of August, for projects in 21, as one example. So, you know, DFAT, and there's also the British Australia season, which is middle of next year, in the, from Australian artists going to England and or, you know, digitally or um, physically, and then the Brits working here um, at the end of next year. And that's also through, you know, British Council and DFAT or the Australian High Commission. Um, so this, yeah, th that is an avenue that even if you're not, uh, even if the government isn't suggesting there's no international travel on the cards coming up, there are organisations that are looking forward. So, um, and th there's no reason why, you know, there's the jazz musicians do get funded in that area as well. Statewide, yes, um, uh, of course, Creative Victoria. Um, one challenge for jazz artists is that the Music Works program is not always an easy one for jazz artists because I personally, but also other people I know, have been told and advised no, if it's a jazz project, don't go. Um, to music works because it's more industry 
and even I've had the instance where I did was presenting an industry thing and was told, no, there won't be anyone on the panel uh, that will be able to speak to jazz. And that's a, that's a whole other separate issue. But yeah, there's, uh, so generally as a jazz artist, the, the advice seems to be go through the Vic Arts grants uh, specifically. Um, but that notion of industry and jazz is one we might pick up on later. Um, but it's certainly those funding, Australia Council Creative Vic are really vital, but local councils, there's Moreland City Council have got grants open at the moment um, for activity in that region. Melbourne City Council have been supporting um, artists. That's a great one. Just check, and, and local government is actually, they've been increasing their support for funding over a number of years now. Uh, while at federal level, it's been slowly coming down. So, um, uh, APRA AMCOS, um, uh, they've got funding. From a jazz perspective, recently, um, there was some criticism in a newsletter from the Melbourne Jazz Co-op that there were not many jazz recipients in the list. Um, I went through, I felt like there were some, um, but maybe a little more on the fringes. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a totally fair critique of APRA AMCOS, but um, personally I've been successful and no other organisations that are, do get support from APRA AMCOS. And so as a, you know, it's, it's definitely, uh, just look for whichever, um, whichever organisations, look at the back of people's CDs, look at their posters, mm -hmm and see the logos um, of who's supporting it. Um, you know, uh, the matched funding comes up with creative, creative partnerships all the time. So, you know, you, if you're looking for support, look and just check out what support other people are getting. Just one quick comment as well with the, that Music Works point, I guess, um, it is always really helpful to call program staff um, at whatever funding body it is that you're applying for and chat about your idea because, you know, we might advise that it is more appropriate to go through one program or another um, and that kind of thing. But there's certainly been plenty of kind of jazz focused projects or activity or showcases that um, jazz ahead and those kind of things that have gone through the Music Works program. So it really just depends on what it is that you're doing and when you want to do it and kind of what works with the timelines and everything like that. But um, yeah, just give us a call, I guess is probably going to be the message I'll drive home throughout this whole panel call uh, funding. Oh, project stuff. <laughs> absolutely. And I think um, that leads into a discussion I want to have as well. And I think Steve, there's a few, Steve, there's a few things I want to talk about creative partnerships, Australia, the importance of that in a moment, but I, I would like to bring up something that's come out of this. I think again, reiterating the talk to fun funding organizations. I know that, um, as a musician, um, that's not the reason I've, you know, got grants sometimes and haven't other times is having had those chats and the, obviously the um, grants officers can't give you specific advice, but they can tell you, you know, straight up whether an idea is going to be eligible or not. And I know from um, APRA AMCOS perspective, doing, you know, being involved with some of our funding programs that you do wish sometimes people would, uh, email or call or something like that, just for some general advice. I mean, I can't tell you over the phone whether it's going to get it, but if you're applying for an organization's grant and you're an individual who wants to make an album, happy, would love to save some time for everyone involved. Um, would like to get everyone's different opinions. Um, and I think this will be a discussion of this will be a point with a few different inputs. And I think that's really, really, really important, but um, what's everyone's thoughts about whether jazz is either underrepresented or appropriately represented with different funding organizations. And I guess, Adam, I might start with you because you teased a little bit of that about like some of the perceptions that, about whether that is in the community about, you know, whether there is, whether it's being appropriately represented or not. Oh, I, 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 I sit on the fence a little because I am in both, can't. Um, I'm, and I've been successful. I've, I've failed. And there's, I, I really don't know when I'm putting something in, which way it's going to go. Um, but it's hard. Jazz is not 
uh, it's not a large um, percentage of the music, the overall music industry. So we shouldn't necessarily get more than whatever our share of the pie is. But at the same time, there are other parts of the industry that can make much more money. And so do they need an equal you know, or a proportionally equal um, part of the pie? And my argument would be that with jazz and, um, you know, and I make a case for this in the submission to the creative state policy is just that jazz is kind of left out of the definition of contemporary music, uh, depending on the conversation, when really there's a whole bunch of uh, jazz artists that are the scaffolding, if you like, for contemporary music in, in terms of the skilled training and you know classical musicians as well. It's those skilled musicians become, uh, they've got these transferable skills that can help adapt to different situations. And so you end up with musicians uh, that come from jazz and end up in all of these more commercial areas like wedding bands, musicals, Cat Empire, are jazz music, trained musicians. So in a way, funding doesn't have to just be, well, you're only 5% of what's going on. So you only get 5% of the funding. If that 5% of that activity actually feeds off into other bits, if there's actually maybe a little more support for the bit where people develop their and have a passion often that helps them uh, contribute to the economic activity in another sector, then maybe it's worth uh, not just doing it on that yeah. straight kind of split. Totally. So in that way, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think it's an interesting one. I think that's a really, really valid point. I'd also like just to go back a step. I think it's what I've noticed being a peer assessor, being things like that as well, is that it's not a criticism, but I think sometimes with the fragment, I think it kind of goes back to what you said as well. The the importance of jazz artists um, being involved with the sector as a whole. I do find sometimes with even being in panels of two people with a broadly jazz background, uh, the concept of what is and isn't jazz can go both ways sometimes. I, I think sometimes from an organisation who works with grants, it's the, sometimes it is admittedly frustrating, the, oh, I don't know, and you know, these people aren't, jazz, you know, is it the no one's being funded that's jazz or is it no one's being funded who's in my crew. And sometimes you do, and I think that it's a tough one for everyone, including the artists, but I think it's, it's how long's a piece of string, but I think that's one. Yeah. It's the kind of, you want to make sure that the, the form is represented, but mm. the way of how people approach the form is interesting as well. And that's a separate issue yeah. for the jazz community to actually realize, you know, because there can often be this split between one style and another or another and what the jazz you know the jazz community needs to realize that outside of the jazz community nobody cares about that um it's all jazz and it's all just over there so if if the jazz community is not united uh then you know it's we're I think that's many genres. I think um, broadly seen <laughs> politics, no matter what, like the difference between jazz or the difference between heavy forms of music, there's they're very strong and very legit arguments internally, but externally, yeah. But um, I think it's really just, cool. oh, sorry, Chloe? I was just going to say, like, coming from an all jazz perspective, um, you know, speaking to the Vic Arts program, as that's the one that I work on mostly, um, we actually don't get a huge amount of, or a huge percentage of, you know, jazz applications coming through to our music category. So, I mean, that argument about, you know, what Adam said around, you know, it being a small kind of community, but also, um, yeah, it's just uh, something that we have noticed across a few programs is that, um, or a few funding rounds, sorry, is that that percentage of applications coming from the jazz sector isn't all that high. Um, so I guess that might be reflected in the successful list as well. So I guess, yeah, just something interesting. So yeah. that, you know, this discussion is happening today. Totally. Uh, kind of, you know, help let some of the new jazz artists coming up and that kind of thing know what's out there and encourage people to apply. Mm, absolutely. And, yeah. Totally. I think that's encouraging. I think out of all this, I think one thing with the discussions we're all having, 
I think at the watch, everyone who's joining in should definitely um, notice that in, apply. It's really worth applying. Don't be discouraged from applying. Have discussions with your peers. Uh, Stephen, I'd love to know from a Creative Partnerships Australia side of the uh, perspective, are you finding many applications for match funding from either the jazz sector or individual artists or groups? Uh, well, I guess, the, you know, the point I made is uh, it's already, I guess, been touched upon is, you know, jazz is an incredibly diverse, uh, you know, uh, genre, if you like. I mean, it's not a, you know, one single homogenous thing. And it certainly means many, many things to many, many different people. Um, you know, and so, you know, often we get into problems around, you know, definition. What, you know, what, <laughs> what, is, what is it and what isn't it and what isn't it? Um, we certainly, uh, you know, receive a lot of interest from musicians and musicians, as Adam, you know, quite rightly point out, point out you know, have got a you know, teaching practice, they've got their sort of commercial work, they've got this sort of individual practice. There were six bands who are, are all different, you know. I mean, that's the classic, you know, portfolio career, if you like. You know, they're writing film scores for short films or what have you. So, um, you know, I, I think jazz is one filter. You know, that when we talk about, a, you know, an artist's practice, jazz is one filter. Is it community work? Is it, you know, it's just a particular thematic? Is it, you know, are they collaborating with another larger project? Is it, you know, a score for a dance work? I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, filters we can put on that work. And I think, you know, one of the skills um, that needs to be honed in writing grants or making applications to various funding bodies uh, is about highlighting the areas which are most likely to get the money. You know, and it might be the collaborative nature of the project. It might not necessarily be totally about the genre of the project. It might be about the community impact. It might be about the thematic concerns of the project. Uh, you know, what impact is this going to have in the world? Is it going to raise, an, uh, uh, raise awareness about an issue? So I think it's important to, you know, really interrogate what the nature of the project is, because jazz is a pretty kind of blunt, big instrument to sort of, or big blunt label to put on something. It's not only jazz. And even if it is only jazz, it's probably something else as well. So it's really important to sort of, you know, think and talk about that. The other point I'd make is, you know, very important to communicate that. And if you can communi communicate that to a person, you know, uh, both Adam and Chloe have mentioned the idea of, you know, calling someone and, and you know, putting a, putting a face or putting a voice to your application, I think is absolutely critical. Uh, we'll hear, hear over and over again that, you know, fundraising, and I would include you know, grants, receiving grants, is all about building relationships, whether that's with the institutional relationship or building that with an individual. And we can sort of talk about the sort of the nuance of that a little bit later, but I think that's incredibly important, um, you know, that you, that you actually humanise the process as, 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 as much as you can. Absolutely. Um, this kind of, we've been talking about some big picture stuff, which is really important, a big picture and background going to get really exciting on early Saturday afternoon and let's delve down to some process, um, which again, legitimately really is interesting and it really is important. Um, so we'll talk, I'll bring up a few questions just for the um, panel and the audience just so you know as well about um, how to apply, what's best to apply funding and assessment panels and other bits and pieces. So again, this is a bit of a, how long is a piece of string, but in your, um, as a panel for your ver um, various experiences, uh, what are some common features found in successful application, you know, successful applications from a jazz perspective and how can, related to that, how can jazz artists uh, practically position themselves well within these applications? Anyone want to start on that one? Or? In with this one first. I guess across the board, um, some things that really make a successful application for Creative Victoria and as I've noticed, you know, with um, being a peer assessor in the past as well, um, you know, having really strong supporting material with your application. So things like a timeline, things like budget notes, contingency planning, just going to that level of detail can really help an application stand out and show the panel assessors that, you know, you've really done the work and you've thought about all of the options here for this project. Um, but then also on that, another side is don't just load up all of the support material you could possibly include. It's really important to have curated support material. So just say you get 10 letters of support, choose your best three 
and you know the best three that really articulate your assessment criteria and really talk to your project and kind of put your best foot forward because a panel member isn't going to be really too keen on reading like you know pages and pages of material when they've got like another hundred applications to um, read through and assess so I guess be mindful of that and curate uh, your support material and kind of add context to it appropriately so you know with your artistic support material as well if you're including a video of performance don't put in a an hour-long video with no notes of what to watch put in an hour-long video maybe with you know watch from 15 minutes to 25 minutes this is like the best part that I'm trying to show you you know about this project or something so um, yeah a couple of tips there mostly around supporting material but it can really make a, an application stand out and yeah be the difference between you know being in a top 10 or being in a top 20. <laughs> And I might just jump in quickly related to that and then um, give some time for Adam and Stephen as well. So I think that's really, really important what Chloe said um, about support material and things like that. A cheeky little tip with support material, I think letters, uh, give, if you want a letter from people, give them time and give them a template to work from. Um, and if you need three letters, maybe ask 10 people, like we'll ask yeah. seven people or whatever. Like, just remember as well that I think with any of this stuff, be mindful of the assessors, um, be mindful of people who you're wanting to work with as well. I know on a personal level through being a musician and my role at APRA AMCOS as well, I get requests for support letters. Happy to do support letters, always happy to do it, but not so happy if I get a request on 4 p.m. The after, of the day the grant's due with no context. Um, <laughs> just those kind of things. It's nice to know because it also means if I know what your project is, I can add personalised notes as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a bit support material. It's worthwhile being considerate of the assessors because, and again, this, um, this is I'm kind of, I'll hand over to Adam and Stephen for a moment as well, but I think it's worthwhile. This is putting my peer assessor hat on. Um, I think it's worthwhile considering what it would be like for you if you were looking at a bunch of applications. So um, I always assume when looking at a, a, when working on a grant for my own work, I assume that the assessment panel knows a lot about music in general because that's why they're on the panel. But I also assume they know nothing about my particular art form. So I think there's a good balance in not overloading people with information, but not assuming people know everything either. So, um, and this is where that making that connection with grants organ you know, organisations and people like that as well. Um, yeah, essentially just put yourself in the shoes that if you had to look at a hundred versions of your application, would you want your application to not have, uh, give, make someone go square eyed? So yeah, bit of a tangent there, but it is worth it. Um, sorry, Adam and Stephen, I imagine you've got some more succinct points that aren't rare already like mine, so I'll hand over to you both. Um, I'll add some. Um... Uh, dot points, which I'm going to go through some dot points. Uh, dot points are really good. Don't just fill it full of information that you think, oh, I've got to f try and cover up the fact I don't actually know how to answer that question. But if I just keep going forever, maybe they'll forget. Um, that's not going to help. Sometimes the best grants are just short, succinct, to the point, And you just go, oh, right. It's really clear. Um, to that is just have uh, be clear in the focus of what your project is. Um, it's a project grant. It's not your career lifetime. I wish I could do this grant. Um, you really have to speak to what uh, you will. You have to actually understand what your project is. It might be part of a larger plan that you've got but you're just going for this one bit. So it's really be clear that that's what it is and maybe articulate how that's part of a larger vision, um, but make everything relevant. And that's another dot point, just it's, uh, same as the letters and support material, relevance. Don't talk about something from some, yeah, you know, people do it. Um, tr uh, Answer the questions. Um, just, it asks you something. The, what you do should speak to that question. Um, don't be a politician. Don't go, well, you know, I've answered that. I don't go over here. Answer the question. Be able to do that thing of um, describe your project. What is, what is your project? 
my project is. Um, you know, if you can just put it that simply, it helps you really clearly understand yourself what you're doing and hopefully, uh, you know, when you have to address the criteria, um, try and just include those words. It's not about special language, the grant speak lingo that you need, but the peer assessors will be having to assess, you know, maybe artistic merit. That's not always one, but sometimes it is. Um, the um, career history or the financial planning or whatever it is. Uh, make, use those words. And it's just as simple as trying to speak the language of whoever it is that you're speaking with. And because then it just becomes easier to communicate. And for a peer assessor, um, if they're looking for financial planning, but you're just talking about the money, it, you know, that's a, it's, maybe that's not the best example, but it's one where they might just kind of, I've been on peer assessment panels where someone's addressed it, mm. but one of the other assessors has kind of gone, well, they haven't really talked about that aspect. And, I'm, mm. and it's been like, no, they did. They just didn't actually use the same word. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, I think I think it's a really valid point as well. You want to do any you, you want to do what you can to not be knocked out. Again, I think we can all speak from having been on various peer assessor boards. It's not fun saying no no to things. It's really difficult, and those tiny details are the things that you can go. Oh, these two applications are both amazing. Oh, the fact that that budget's not very good is the pains assessors to do yeah, it but yeah, like yeah. if you have to make that call that's the one you're going to do um i'm just going to ask one more uh, oh, can one i may one. i add on letters yes uh, sorry on yes. letters try and write the letter for your um, yes. people because often as you were saying andrew um often you run out of time and some people will get asked to write more letters and as a peer assessor you will see the same person pop up maybe a few times but if you can write something or um, and you can add a little extra context that you can't do in the body of the grant because you run out of words, yep. but you can use that person to speak of totally. about that aspect. Exactly. And but show personal connection. Oh, um, totally. So important. So I'll, ask, I'll just ask, bring up one more thing about the assessment panels. And I've got a few questions for Stephen uh, about the creative partnership side of things. And then I'm conscious of the time as well. Um, I guess as well, it's a, just a quick one from everyone on this, um, and I'll, I've got a point about this as well. How much do you think a peer assessor's personal music background affects their likelihood to recommend an application for funding or not? Just a quick, quick couple of, like, quick line or two from everyone about this. I'm happy to start and be slightly controversial on it. Um, going from what uh, Adam was saying before about, re you know, waffling on, Sometimes having an advocate for you is fantastic, for your sector is great. Sometimes it's not necessarily. Sometimes, I mean, I've been on an assessment panel where someone did something that read really, really well, but the expert in that session went, no, that actually doesn't make any sense. So um, I think if you can word your application in a way that will get you, make, you, uh, make a peer assessor an advocate, um, that'll be great. I know that having been on panels myself, there's things that, because the application was amazing, I fought real hard for it. Um, but I think making everyone be succinct applications make everyone an advocate for you, I think. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I mean, peer assessors, you know, the, the assessment panels are generally made up of people from varying different music styles and backgrounds and, you know, career levels and that kind of thing. So, and they're all going to be assessing, you know, anywhere between 50 to 100 applications, depending on the grant round. So, Sure, there might be some that they're more familiar with, but there's going to be so many that they might not be, you know, in that bubble of the sector. Um, and, you know, that's why they're being kind of, that's why their expertise is being used just for their knowledge of their pocket, but also for their perspective on the other pockets of the sector. So um, I don't think their, ta their taste, I guess, on, you know, what, what they're into really comes into it as much because they're also assessing it against all these other criteria and on the artistic merit there's usually so many other criteria that they're looking at an application for as well so um it's probably a factor but i don't think it's like a defining factor between you know 
yes or no application kind of things. Totally. I'm mindful of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into a few questions. Can I? I'm going to be the, the hard ass and move on just because um, I'm conscious that Stephen, we haven't had a chance to chat much about the creative partnership side of things. So um, Stephen, I'd really like to get a bit more information from you and a bit of context for the group um, about what creative partnerships Australia and the Australia, Australian Cultural Fund does and how that form of fundraising is an effective strategy and alternative to the kind of let's apply for government funding from X. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Um, well, look, I, you know, I, I'm not sure how much to assume from um, the people who are kind of um, uh, with us today in terms of Creative Partnerships Australia, but basically Creative Partnerships Australia is a federal government agency, arm's length from government, that is uh, essentially established to assist artists and arts companies with their non-government fundraising. So while we, you know, while I can sort of talk about grants and advise on grants, and there are sort of obviously transferable skills and networks and knowledge in relation to government grants and other aspects of fundraising, uh, our focus is really on what we would call uh, private sector support or non-government support. So really that involves uh, individual philanthropy and private benefaction, it involves uh, strategies around trusts and foundations, philanthropic trusts and foundations. Uh, we do a lot of work with, um, with, with that area. Uh, it's also about, um, uh, you know, uh, digital fundraising. You know, you mentioned the Australian Cultural Fund. So the Australian Cultural Fund is essentially our online uh, uh, digital fundraising platform. That can be used in a number of ways, but essentially, I guess its essential element is that it, it allows individual artists and small companies who don't have deductible gift recipient status to offer a tax receipt to, to, to donors. So essentially, as an individual artist, you can act like a charity um, and receive that, that status. Um, you know, Sports Foundation have a similar thing. So if you're an Olympic athlete trying to get to the Commonwealth Games or whatever, you can channel donations through um, the Sports Foundation. Similarly, if you're an artist trying to raise money from um, uh, private individuals, you can offer them a tax receipt as they, uh, as they, uh, as they make a donation to you. So essentially that's our strategy. Um, you know, broadly, I work across Victoria and Tasmania with artists and arts organisations. My role is essentially to um, you know, coach and mentor artists and arts organisations around this area. Um, and basically I work on a sort of case management um, sort of model really. So if there's anyone out there who, you know, who wants to chase us up, really happy to, um, you know, obviously take a Zoom call at this time and, to, and talk through the, 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 the nuances and the specifics of every, everyone's individual case. I think there's a sort of broad brushstroke there that says, you know, fundraising is particular. Um, you know, you've got to kind of understand the nuance, the ins and outs of a particular project to, you know, um, guide that project in a particular way. You know, a quick comment on support material. Um, you know, there was a bit of discourse around support material there. Um, support material can also kill your project as well. Um, so I think it's really important, you know, when you're making decisions around, you know, what support material you'll put in there. I mean, Chloe made a great point, you know, if you put in sort of masses and, of generic material, uh, that, can, that can be death by support material you know, very, think very carefully about the sort of support material that's going to enhance any, any application. You know, often I think the best advocate for, uh, for an artist's work is their actual work. So if you have something that is incredibly compelling and powerful, so, you know, a recording or, you know, um, something that's incredibly indicative and powerful and compelling about your work, obviously that's the best, the best sort of support material. Um, but we work, uh, essentially, I think we're about sort of trying to build skills in the, in the sector amongst artists and arts organisations. I mean, the research is pretty unequivocal. The reasons why people don't give you money is number, uh, the, the two main reasons people don't give you money are number one, we don't ask. So people are reluctant to ask. Uh, and I would, I would sort of expand that to say they don't ask at the right time, in the right way, or for the right reason. So there's some nuance around that, around sort of building that. And, um, you know, the, the, second, uh, the second most uh, most prevalent reason that people don't uh, receive money is because uh, obviously often people don't know you need it. 
you know, as a communication piece around that. I think, you know, you've got, in a way, as an artist or an arts organisation, you've got to communicate need without being needy. There's a bit of a kind of nuance around that as well. So we can assist with all, all that, with that sort of area, I guess. Fantastic. And following on from that, I'd love to get um, some quick thoughts from all of you um, about how you think the funding landscape is going to evolve in this certain time about like how do we continue strategies, how do we maybe realign or how do we recommend um, emerging and established jazz artists align, you know, align or change their or continue their strategy? I can certainly talk to that, Andrew. I mean, I've spoken to, you know, lots and lots of uh, artists and arts organisations um, you know, particularly over the last six months. Uh, and obviously, you know, things are very uncertain at the moment. But I do think we are moving from a period of, of crisis and emergency sort of management. Um, you know, I was very pleased to hear Adam talk about, you know, the future and th how things are kind of, you know, where at least their mind's eye are opening up and there is, uh, you know, there is a, a bright future to look forward to. And I think, um, you know, if there's a, was a zeitgeist out there in the sector, I think it's about that. We're now moving from, okay, we've, we've kind of traversed this sort of crisis moment um, through to looking at what is the blue sky? Where are the opportunities? Where are the organisations that have done really well through this, through this period? Maybe that's about online or digital delivery. Maybe it's about, you know, kind of reassessing what they're doing in a particular way. Um, there's many examples, uh, great examples of organisations who are, who, who have changed up their practices, you know, for the better, which will sustain through the post-COVID period um, and that will see, you know, a brighter future. So I think, you know, we're really now refocusing on, okay, what is the opportunities uh, as we kind of, you know, move into, um, you know, opening up again, even though, of course, we're not currently at that point yet. But I think, you know, our artists and arts community have done, have shown an incredible resilience in dealing with the uncertainty that all, you know, all this um, business is sort of pre presented and, you know, are uh, uh, em um, employing their creativity around, you know, tra traversing this time. Fantastic. Um, Adam, I'd like to get a couple of thoughts from you on that as well. And then we'll move quickly as we're conscious of time to few, I mean, not quickly from you, but like once we've done um, your bit, we'll have a quick discussion about um, grant writers and a few other things. So love to hear some th thoughts from you with, uh, you know, sector and also, as an artist about where you think things can, can hopefully or may potentially move forward? Yeah, it's, um, there's so many conversations that are positive and negative. It's, um, uh, it's hard to know. Um, the challenge with funding over the last period has been, there's been lots of it, but in very small bits and uh, it's, it's been great. It's, it's kind of doing what the government has been trying to do at a larger level of just getting cash flowing through the system. Um, uh, but it's, and, and that's kind of fair enough because no one's really able to do much long-term planning at this point, but there are those grants coming up again, where we can start thinking long-term. So I'm excited to see what people do with that. Um, I think, uh, things like digital, online, is just going to have to be part of the thinking. I personally, it's a pain in the bum um, to have to include that um, because it just involves sort of developing new skill sets, more, um, we don't have much industry in that regard. It's um, jazz musicians, the jazz sector, doesn't have much of that kind of structural infrastructure and support. Um, so that's a challenge for us. It tends to be the individual artist that ends up doing everything. Yep. So to add more on top for the average jazz artist is going to be hard work. Um, but there's real possibilities and we're going to have to do that. We're going to... Um, there's the opportunity for us to get touring and performing earlier than other parts of the music sector because um, we don't need so much production. We often are, you know, 20 people. There's a lot of jazz gigs that are doing this on a regular basis going, yay, we got 20. 50 would be fantastic at a lot of jazz gigs. So for us to be performing to small audiences that are seated and ticketed, 
um, means that that's going to be easier. We can be cheaper to present because um, of less production. Uh, if it's instrumental genres of music um, will be better than if you've got singers um, with the current um, issues around choirs, for instance. So jazz is in a good position to uh, get performing earlier, quicker, and it could actually, there's some real opportunities to develop that. So, yeah. And I think that's a really important point you brought up as well. I think particularly for um, jazz and that's, you know, within Victoria and around the country as well, that at least your point as well about skill sharing and collaborating. I think this is, um, it's always something that's really, really important. Um, and I think particularly now this is where if you can do performances and engage someone online, maybe that's sharing through networks. Maybe there's like a couple of go-tos for um, within the scene, you know, jazz, various jazz scenes. It's a person who's good at documentation. You can just, you know, that person skills up that way. Um, bit of a heavy segue, um, you know, re real smooth um, to some, another little point about um, collaboration. So I'm just going to quickly get thoughts um, uh, yes, no, or depends on um, one word answers for everyone about grant writers. What are your thoughts on grant writers? Should people hire them? Yes, no, or depends? Anyone? Uh, uh, conflict of interest. I am a grant writer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen? Look, I think it depends. Yeah, great. So I think that... You know, I mean, we're going to one word on this one, but I think there's, there's some room for new ones on this in a moment. Well, I mean, look, you know, um, Adam, I know, is a terrific, you know, articulate, um, you know, experienced person, and I'd have no hesitation putting, you know, my precious project in the hands of someone like him. But I think, you know, you've got to work out who's the best advocate for your project. And, you know, often panels want to hear from the source. Um, you know, if you're an artist, though, who doesn't necessarily have, um, you know, the kind of, um, you know, organisational language skills or, you know, uh, you know, English might not be your first language. There's all sorts of nuances around that. So I think there's, you know, there's some, there's some further sort of discussion about that. But, um, Absolutely. you know, finding the right voice for your mm. project is very important. Yep, absolutely. And Chloe, your thoughts? Um, just knowing, being from an organisation, what are your thoughts on whether it's necessary or not for Creative Victoria grants? Definitely depends. Yeah. Um, depends on the type of grant, depends on the project and those kinds of things. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I've just got a question from the audience about um, grant writing, actually. Um, just received a question from someone, um, from Tali Helene about, or Tali Helene rather, um, about writing grants and you know being a bit of a, fra a freelance grant writer. The question was about not really they're not really sure about what the standard is for charging for gr freelance grants writing. Um, I'm just, from my perspective, I think if you know other grants people who write grants, just ask them direct. Um, unless I don't know if Adam or Chloe or Stephen, if you have any divergent thoughts, but I mean I know my situation was if people asked me what my grants rate is, I'd absolutely tell them um, when I was doing grants. I'm not going to do it now because my rate is, you know, was also conscious of that I was working full time as well as doing grants. So I might charge less than other people. But I think just ask grant writers direct. Some people will charge a higher upfront fee. Some people will charge a fee in percentage. Some people will just do a percentage. So I think with any of this stuff, it's really important just to ask your peers. Don't treat you. Don't treat the people around you as competition. Pe treat the people around you as your peers, as your future collaborators, as um, in kind of going to what Adam mentioned, it's where we are all having to diversify. Um, where someone else has got a skill set, just work with them on their skill set and they can work with you on your skill set. So, yeah, I think I'm a depends for grants writers as well. Um, mindful of the time, four minutes. I'm just going to see if there's any other questions. Um, I've got a couple of points, a couple of Tony Jones style as a take it as comments. Um, Stevens just pointed out that he's available via the Creative Partnerships Australia website uh, for more specific and nuanced conversations. So you can make a request via the online inquiry channel. He can help where he can. 
Um, we so Andrew, I just also made the point, um, you know, we're a free service. Yeah. Um, I'm totally free, although I'm not cheap, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, also like to just give a shout out to Adam's The Usefulness of Art site, tuoa.com.au. Well worth having a squiz, deep dive in there. Um, got a comment as well from Kirsty Rivers, the new head of music at Australia Council for the Arts, formerly of Creative Victoria, formerly of APRA. Um, Kirsty's pointed out that it's important to make that connection to the grants team. I'm not on the last day, just, you know, give a bit more time. Um, people have, there's time for everyone, but there's more time for you not at 4 p.m. that day. Um, and Kirsty also put, did a really important point that's relevant to, I think, all of what we're talking about today. Put yourself to be, forward to be an assessor, for, you know, or just work with these things where they arise. I know that I've made some great friendships and some learnt so much about the broader sector from the times I've been on peer assessor panels. And again, you learn that they're really great people. Um, like it's not, the panel isn't this hoity-toity, like people sitting around an ivory tower. It's music fans who are having tough discussions. It's like, it's not easy going through applications. Um, it's fun seeing cool stuff. And I guess part of it as well, just going back a few steps, talking about um, having an advocate, what you really want to do, and I can't remember who brought it up, but have the point be really succinct in application, particularly as a summary. You want to get people psyched on your application. Like, oh, I, you know, it might be someone doesn't know anything about, you know, um, might be something, you know, free jazz, or it might be something that's really, really, really tightly composed or whatever it is. If you hook people in, um, you'll, you want a peer assessor to be keen on what you're doing. Um, so like they'll, you know, they'll put you forward for a grant and they'll want to hear about it later on. So yeah, mindful of time. That there's, sorry. I was just going to say one quick hot tip on that is getting yeah. someone not involved in your project or your practice to read your application. So like totally. a member or a partner. So, you know, seeing if the context and that kind of stuff, there's enough information that they understand it, but it's not too jargony. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mindful that we've got two minutes before the um, very exciting and awesome performance at one o'clock with David Jones. And there's so much more um, today from the you know the Melbourne International Jazz Festival. So, uh, quick, anyone's got any final quick sentence thoughts? Otherwise, I'll wrap up and we can um, start watching some music. Anything from anyone, Adam? The rejection. Don't worry. It happens to most yeah. people. Yeah, uh, it, it's not reflective of, of you. Think of funding as an opportunity for you to offer something in partnership with the person that you're applying for funding from um, and see it as them connecting with what you're doing rather than a handout uh, and you can get a different kind of place. Absolutely. I don't think we can top that. That's a fantastic one. That was really important. It's, it's an interesting discussion. Um, please feel free to contact every, any of us and we can always assist where we can. Um, again, I would like to uh, thank the partners for these creative development panels, Arts Centre Melbourne, APRA AMCOS and Melbourne International Jazz Festival. Uh, let's all go watch uh, David Jones's performance at melbournejazz.com. Thanks so much to our panel. Thank you to all. Bye for now.